you very, very much for the kind introduction. And uh, I have to apologize for me walking like this, but uh, I've just sprayed my ankle two days ago. So uh, it's either that or I'm, I'm not here. So well, you'll have to deal with it. So uh, I have to thank the organizers for having uh, invited me to come here. And when they did that a couple of months ago, I thought, oh yeah, that's, that's uh, because it was a long time ago. Right? Yeah, that's, uh, you can talk about whatever you want about security and network and stuff. Oh, I had this thing I wanted to do for a long time. You know, let's sit back, look at you know, state of the art after n years. It's going to be a cool talk to do. What a stupid idea I had. I mean, it's been a lot of work to prepare, actually. <laughs> Seriously, when you start digging and you discover things, it's ooh, terrible. Anyway, well, here we are. And of course, I thought, oh, I had a lot of time, right? Because it was several months ago. And then uh, I met my friend, Procrastination. And uh, so anyway, so I, I hope you'll enjoy it anyway. And uh, so before uh, saying, talking, going to my talk itself, so for those of you who don't know, QCRI is Qatar Computing Research Institute, one of the three research national labs in in Qatar, we do research, applied research, impactful research. We do not teach. We do not seek funding. It's centrally funded, so it's a pretty cool place to be. My team now in cybersecurity is around 20 people, and we are hiring more. Uh, so are the other groups. And so QCRI is now it's been funded five years ago. Uh, now it's 125, and, and keep growing. So. I know, keep this on, on, on your radio screen. I think it's a very nice, interesting place to be a part of. And we are under HBKU, which is the new university created by uh, Qatar over there. Uh, forward, just to make sure you're not shouting at me or anything. This is not exhaustive. This is not something you can bring to your student and say, this is, you know, this is what has happened over the last 30 years. This is just my own subjective view, picking up a few things here and there, and hopefully making a story out of it. Um, some of those things are controversial, some of those things probably are hopefully thought-provoking. Uh, I'm just stating the facts, don't read too much into what I'm saying. I'm not a conspiracy theorist or whatever, I'm just stating the facts, and then hopefully we'll have discussions afterwards. And, and of course, because I only have one hour, uh, less than an hour, um, I cannot cover everything. There are lots and lots and lots and lots of things that I could have covered, like especially the new things, like this big data analytics things, and the uh, APT things, and this uh, Stuxnet things, and I'm not going to cover that. Okay, if you're disappointed, it's time to leave, but uh, I'd rather try to go in the, in the past and see, you know, if there is anything we can learn from the past. Hopefully, again, this will be of interest. So, uh, that's the overview of my talk. Uh, I, I think we agree we have a problem with security, right? I mean, if we don't agree with that, then it's a bad stuff. Uh, so let's figure out what the problem, the origin of the problems are, and then I'll cover three points, the consequences of these problems, the solutions we have brought to the problems, and the problems those solutions have brought us and then some conclusion. So, first of all, why I think it's important to look about the past is because I love Confucius, probably, right? It says, study the past if you would define the future. And we as researchers, we definitely want to define the future, right? Um, but Burke also said that those who don't know history are designed to repeat it. And I think we have made lots of mistakes in the past, especially when it comes to security. So we, we better try not to repeat it. And unfortunately, yeah, I'm getting old and I'm, I'm seeing things that, you know, just, we are reinventing the wheel sometimes and sometimes we are making it square, which is not great. And last but not least, uh, Alvin Sackler said that men do not learn very much from the lessons of history is the most important of all lessons of history. So hopefully uh, we're not going to do that. So, Bit of history. This is a com networking computing conference. So what happened on January 1st, 1983? Some of you should know, definitely know. I see lots of gray hair. So uh, 
And Eddie, come on, come on, come on, wake up. Come on, this is supposed to be interactive. So January 1st, 1983, it has something to do with the internet. Really. You're not supposed to answer, you have seen the answer, the reply. So uh, come on. No, 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 the collapse already, 1983? No, no, no. It's a great day. It's a great day. 1st, January 1983. It has something to do with TCP IP. Yeah? Arpanet. Yeah, but what Arpanet? Officially opening day, whatever it's called. Yeah, that's, that's something along those lines. That's a flag day. Flag day. This is the day where whoever wanted to connect to Arpanet and was not yet using TCP IP was supposed to move on to upgrade and run TCP IP. All the systems on that day have rebooted and all at the same time have started using TCP IP. 33 years ago. That sounds like a century ago, right? Imagine if you wanted to do this today. 1st January 2017, everybody get rid of IPv4, we all move to IPv6. What's the chance of this to work? Mm. <laughs> it did happen. It did work. It was only 33 years ago. Can you, I mean, does that make you, you know, click the, the difference how quickly things have changed in only 33 years. So what happened during those, this period? So, when do you think we had first real commercial usage of the internet? When did it really stop? 95. 95. What are the names? Numbers? Yeah, 95 is a good answer. Actually, it officially started in 92, right? Because this is when the uh, US Congress said, you know, now you can connect also commercial networks to the NSF network. But in, in fact, it really started in 95, as you will see in one of the... Uh, the before 92, there was absolutely no commercial purpose for the NSF net, as it was called at that day. It was just geeky people, like you and me, you know, research, education, friends, good guys, right? Only good guys on the internet, no bad guys. And that's very, very important to keep in mind. 92, this is 24 years ago. So when did the general public got access to it? More or less the same period, 89. This is the company called The Word was the first one to actually provide dial-up access for whoever wanted at this very big price of $20 a month. And then they just started doing that, and then uh, people from NSF came to them and said, whoa, 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 what are you going to do there? Uh, what happens if some of those people misbehave? Because, you know, we know how to do with, with the students. We just, you know, throw them away from the university and that's it, right? But here, this is people. How, how do we do? So they didn't know. And because of that, for several months, they said, no, there's a whole part of the internet that you guys do not have access to. And then they have to work on, and then they discuss, and then, and then someday they go to me and say, oh, that's fine, now you have access to everything. But again, think of it, it was not designed and it was not thought of to be dealing with normal people. Internet was actually defined, the term, officially, you know, legal terms and so on, in 95. 95, this is when the Federal Networking Council agrees to say this is the internet. Logically linked together by a globally unique address space based on IP, uh, able to support communication using TCP IP and provides, makes accessible publicly or privately, service layer on communication related infrastructure described area. So it was important to have a definition because, as I've been said before, 95 is really when real commercialization really took place. 95 is when we have SSL coming in. SSL, which of course was going to secure all the transactions on the internet. And then we have the first internet access provider, CompuServe, America Online, Prodigy, and, and then we had a couple of uh, Companies coming in, Amazon.com, Craigslist, something called Eco Bay, that eventually became eBay, and the original NSFNet was eventually decommissioned. 
Okay? That was 95. So again, remember, before 95, there was no commercial value on the internet. There basically was nothing to protect. Right? But things had been created way before. Before 95. The, the internet as we use it today, the internet that we still rely on today, dates back way before that. When was the first RFC? The very first RFC. Yeah. Now, between 63 and 73, it's 69. RFC number one, IMP Interface Message Processor. 69. But the important ones are those ones. FTP, 1980. SMTP, 82. We're still using SMTP today. Yeah, of course, it has changed a lot, and so, but it's, it's still those principles there. DNS, 83. DNS, DNS. This is the core of the internet. This is the thing, right? 83, the principles were there. Of course, things have changed, have kind of debugged, improved, but it's still, it's still from those. And HTTP, 96. So, that is very key. I mean, it's been built in a world where there was absolutely no consideration for commercial purpose and no risk, no threat, no bad guys, no nothing. If you look at the design principle, there is this paper published at six, Sitcom on 1888 where it says the first goal of the internet is to develop an effective technique for multiplex utilization of existing interconnected networks. And you have a number of design principles, besides the, the one that we all know about, be the, the smartness uh, on the edge, and so on and so forth, right? This is a, a more extended version of it. What is interesting here is that when you read these eight design principles, the word security does not appear a single time in this 10-page document. It's not there. It's just not there. Because it's, it's not there. It's as simple as that. It is not a problem in 1988. It was not a problem before that. It didn't be, become a problem before way later. And because of that, you, you basically design something with some properties and characteristics, and then suddenly you use it for something else. It's just like you know, buying a Tesla to go doing some dunes bashing in the desert. That's probably not a good idea, even though it's a good car, supposedly. So, what about security? I mean, the fathers of the internet were just unconscious, they were not thinking, they were not smart enough to think about it. No, it's not true, actually they did. If you look, of course, people would say that. This is the common wisdom, right? It says, they thought they were building a classroom and it turned into a bank. To some extent, it is true, right? This, is, this was for education, research, and so on and so forth. And now you want to make it a bank. And you want to have, you know, all your transactions. And now you want to have air traffic control. And now you want to have surgery over the internet. And now you want to have everything, critical infrastructures, everything from what was initially supposed to be a classroom. Yeah, that's a problem, but actually some of them had thought about it. In the 70s, Surf and CAN, when they initially thought about how to design TCP IP, from the very beginning, they said we need to have encryption. It was just the beginning of encryption. We didn't have all the techniques we know now and all the algorithm and everything, but still they thought, yeah, we, we, sh we should really have that into it. From, from, from ground zero, we should have encryption to ensure integrity, to ensure confidentiality, and all these things, right? Well, the NSA was really in favor of it. So that's a good idea. For military purposes. They were not so, so eager to have it for commercial users. And uh, besides that, also, to be completely honest, I'm not saying this is just NSA says no, 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 that's not the point. 
it's one element, it's one dot in the big picture. The other, of course, is that we didn't have the tools we have today, we didn't have the technology we have today in terms of crypto algorithm and everything. And even if we had, key management is a mess. It's very, very, very complicated to do. So if you want to build a system which is very, very generic, which needs to scale and everything, uh, it's very complicated to think of encryption at the TCP IP level. And people might even say it's an open discussion. Is that the right level to have it or not, right? So eventually, they just abandoned the idea. They just said, OK, we move to something else. No security in TCP IP. But the discussion had taken place, at least. Also, in 73, Matt Kauf, uh, who actually used to be your keynote speaker last year, I understand, uh, said he wrote a formal message, a formal message to the ARPANET working group, and he was saying, oh, you know, this is unacceptable, uh, this is what I'm seeing happening, uh, my system is being crashed by people outside, uh, this is not good. Um, the, there was not the root password at that time, it was another word, but it's the equivalent of it. Um, they have changed it and compromised it. And I really believe that there is much more security problems than we think there is. That's a quote from 1973. Doesn't that sound somehow familiar? Isn't that something we keep hearing all the time? It was already part of the discussion at that time. So, Yes, there was no commercial need and so on and so forth, but people are people and people keep doing stupid things and uh, in a more or less organized way, but you know. So what I want you to, to understand at this point is that really the, the threat scenario was just missing. So there were lots of research kind of starting on formal method, Mac, mandatory access control and so on and so forth, cover channels, mostly inspired by what the military this is this is where their mindset was coming from. And the mundane threats that could have come out from the commercial world utilization were just disregarded. For instance, 1978, very first spam, at least this is what you know people report as the very first spam. This is poor guy Gary Turk, whose name will pass forever in the world as the first spammer. Uh, the poor guy just is a marketeer from DEC at that time and he sent an email to announce an event, right? To 600 people, a big spam. Come on, now he's spent to 600 millions, but that's ah, okay, it's the first spam. And the response to that email by the person, because it was a guy, the Pentagon, who was overseeing this, he sent another email, all with caps, saying, This is a flagrant violation and we're going to take measures so that it will never, ever happen again. I think this is a good idea. I mean, I wish you could have done that. So, this is just an example, right? Then, uh, in the 80s, there, there was this feeling that, you know, yeah, in the 70s, we have built the internet, we have come out with all these things, and so on. Now, maybe we should think a bit about security, right? And this is actually the first conference, actually, is SP, Symposium on Security and Privacy, was created in the 1980s. Right? Um, so it's good, but let me make a digression here. I want to talk about the Dahu. For those of you who know me uh, know that the Dahu is my favorite animal. So the Dahu is this, as you can read here, and it comes from, comes from science, science on the internet, right? So just for the younger ones, don't believe everything you read on the internet. So, the Dahu is this extremely shy animal living in the, between France and Italy in the Alps, in the mountains. And it has adapted to this very steep environment by having one leg shorter than the other one. Because it's steep, right? And so, here is actually a representation, authentic representation of the Dahu, right? So, you see it's adapted and it's been told that the male turns clockwise and the female turns counterclockwise. And just sometimes they meet and they do what they have to do to maintain the species. And uh, so it's a very, very interesting animal, right? I mean, who, who wouldn't love to find one? So you can buy books, and that's true. I have books myself at home. 
that explain where you can find the diamond, what they eat, how they reproduce, uh, how you could catch them, and so on and so forth, right? So I can understand that it's 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 very interesting. I would love to actually find a dahu and just you know see it work, walk, whatever. So I, from an intellectual point of view, this is a very stimulating animal, right? And and I would say in security, because we had no idea how the bad guys looked like in the 80s, we have made assumptions about them. We have invented them, the same way we have invented Dahu. And we have created what I would call Dahusian research, looking for Dahusian hackers, and basically creating Dahusian solutions. Right? Solutions that as soon as you try them with real people and real hackers, basically don't work. And I'm a culprit, right? I'm just I'm as guilty as everybody else. I have produced papers that probably had just no practical use because they were just based on false assumptions. And that's bad. But that was fun at that time because there was no attack anyway. So you know, it's research, right? But uh, things are changing, right? So now it's a bit more serious. So uh, I think it took us almost, I would say, around two decades. So 80s and 90s. <laughs> To realize that, you know, now maybe it's getting serious. Maybe we should we should really try to do things that, that matter and, and try to help because now security is important, is relevant in the internet for the society. We have an ethical and a moral responsibility to make sure this thing is secure because it isn't. And um, we also realized too late, I would say, that there were interesting animals out there, real bad ones, and they were about to old markers because they were, they were good. They were getting better and better and better. And the situation is even worse today. But you have to realize that this myth of security by obscurity was the cause of, of that problem. Up to, I would say, end of the, 20, uh, the 90s, it was, you were not supposed to disclose a new vulnerability that you have discovered. It was bad. It was, no, 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 the bad guys will learn about it. You were not supposed to disclose things. I mean, there were people doing it, but it was not really felt like, hey, this is a good thing to do. So people were, you know, saying security by obscurity works. And it's only in 1999 that the CVA says, so common vulnerability and exposure, a site where all the vulnerabilities are identified, receive a common uh, identifier so that all the intrusion detection systems and correlations and so on can actually talk about the same things. It's only got created in 1999. I, I was involved in discussions before that, uh, heard you with several other people to do a, a common vulnerability database, and it was, we had a lot of people saying, no, 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 we shouldn't do that, it's too dangerous. At the same time, the underground forums were just sharing lots and lots of information between script kiddies and stuff. So, for many years, we have built things without thinking about security. And we were doing research that was not really relevant with respect to what bad people could do with the bad thing. So, let's take a few look at a couple of things that have happened. And, uh, it's a very limited view, right? So, you all have heard about the famous internet war, right? November 2nd, the date is important, 1988. So, Robert T. Morris, student, actually, oops, sorry, let his worm go around and just goes all around the internet and use three different ACTAC vectors, a buffer overflow, uh, a stupid configuration debug mode in send mail, and also a basic brute force password guessing method. 1988. Okay, that's what you probably all know, right? So, a few things to remember. And of course, everybody said, oh, it costs billions. Robert Morin is bad, bad, bad. It will never work in security or anywhere else afterwards this guy is 
burn forever, right? This guy published two technical reports working for at and as a student, publishing security vulnerabilities in 83 and 84, 84 and 85, who just got completely ignored by everybody else, by everybody. He had warned the CMU staff about this film a year before, didn't make any difference. His father, Robert Morris, had actually written a paper in 79, talking about the dangers of, you know, bad passwords, that people should really do something about passwords, right? Again, didn't really make any difference. And just as a side note, because I think it's amusing, the very first virus was written by Stephen Cohen for a seminar class on November 3rd, 1983. Oh, sorry, 83. That should be 83. It's a typo. Five years, just five years. It's certainly a coincidence. Because at the end, we weren't slept by accident, so it must be a coincidence. Just saying. There are not so deaf as those who don't want to hear, right? So, what I'm saying is that this worm went out using stuff that everybody knew that people have tried to talk about and nobody was listening to. Another example, DDoS, the big DDoS attack, February 2000, big, big DDoS attack, February 7, 2000. Well, maybe all of you are too young to remember, but I can remember. I was, I mean, many of you were waiting probably December 31st, 1999. Because what happened December 31st, 1999? What were we waiting for? Two zeros. Yes, Y2K. Everybody was waiting for the Y2K bug that would just collapse the internet and the whole world, right? The media were watching everywhere in the world. What's going to happen in Australia? Okay, Australia survived. Good. Let's move on. No, let's go wrong. Or whatever. So, you see what I mean? Everybody was watching, and we were watching also not for Y2K, we were watching for a major DDoS attack because we knew it would potentially come, but it didn't come. Eventually, it came on February 2000. Yahoo went down. A few days after, more sites had been hit. And it was the first kind of so-called distributed denial of service attack. And the spin doctors had done a perfect job. If you look at the press release of that time, at first it was Yahoo, ha ha ha, ha. You, come on, you, you cannot even dimension the server properly so that you cannot resist the script kitty? Come on, loser, right? And then others, eBay, buy, CNN, and then the spin doctors came in and said, wow, this is serious, this is really serious, you know? All the best web servers, e-commerce, on the world, in the world, they cannot resist. This is very important. You see, the spin is changing, right? So much that after that, if you look, February 10, 15, and so on, you have press releases coming from companies nobody had ever heard of. Jumping and saying, we have been victims too, we have been victims too, we too should be listed with these guys as being the top best websites, e-commerce in the world. Because it was good free advertisements just to be, you know, in the same bag as all these guys. So it was a fabulous time. I mean, I, it was really funny, uh, if you remember those who were there at the time. So what is not so well known is that DOS attacks are very, very old. In 88, the first IRC is written, so Internet Relay Chat, by uh, Jarko Orkarinen. I'm probably mispronouncing it because it's uh, Finnish, I think. Uh, and in the 80s, the first denial of service that I on the internet were actually using, were actually against IRC members. They were so-called IRC warriors, just to split the channel and then own the people and just you didn't like what somebody had said and you just kick him out and so on and so forth. Very juvenile kind of things. But in 96, there was the first bulletins on explaining what SIM flood attacks were and what uh, another one on UDP flood. 
And in 97, they even produced a summary of all everything they knew about ongoing DOS attacks, denial of service attacks. So it was known in 96 and 97. And in 1999, three months before the attack, there has been a major meeting at CERT, Pittsburgh, where they invited 30 experts and said, hey, look, we have a problem here. We need you to pay attention, and we need you to spread the word. And there is this very good report. You can find it online. It's a very good report. What was the report about? They noticed that something had happened in July, and the university, with big access to the internet, had been completely shut down from the internet for three days with a new kind of tool, which was a distributed denial of service tool. So somebody had lots of bots and used them just to flood some networking connection. And it was new. So somebody somewhere had no infrastructure to run these attacks. And it was a problem. So they said, hey, what should we do, right? So they were saying, you know, it's not something that is potential. It's real. We have seen it happening. And so they, they made concrete recommendation for all the people, managers, sysadmin, ISPs, IRP, because this is not something you can really prevent. This is something you have to have techniques for to react to if it happens. And it's not and it's something that is also technical, but also business decision. You have to decide which website you're ready to sacrifice, which one you're not. So degraded modes, and so on and so forth. So you have to think ahead. And they said, okay, managers, this is what you have to do. Sysadmin, this is what you have to do. It's a very good report even today. This is a must read for everybody who is caring about DDoS. But DDoS did happen. Again, there are no so deaf at those who will not hear. Problems were known. Techniques were known. Dry runs had been observed. People did not react. That's a problem. Another one, DNS, DNS poisoning attack. In 2008, Dan Kaminsky, he got, he got terrible, terrible you know, reputation at that time because he was explaining how to do practically DNS poisoning. Even though he had worked for almost a year just trying to find the fixes and get it, you know. So he got really bad feedback and reputation for coming out, basically. But, in 1990, Stephen Bellamy, he finds that another, he had found a DNS flow in 1990, right? And he withhold publication of it until 1995 in a major conference. There was a public, there was a technical report, but the public thing was delayed until 1995. But that work led to the creation of an RFC in 97 on DNSSEC. He said, because of what Bellopin had showed, people realized, oh yeah, yeah, we should, we should, really, we should really fix DNS. We should, we should have integrity, authenticity, and so on and so forth. Let's, let's work on DNSSEC. And the first RFC is 1997, okay? But nobody cared. For more than 10 years, nobody cared. Agreed, there were issues with the way it was initially defined, more work had to be done, and so on and so forth, but still, it, didn't, it shouldn't have taken 10 years. Worse, in 2002, there was a new technique called the birthday paradox that actually showed that it was actually much easier to do DNS poisoning than initially thought, 2002. But it's only in 2008 when Kaminsky eventually pushed and made it very practical and that we saw lots of people then doing these attacks that the uh, Office of Management and Budget made it mandatory for all the agencies to actually buy in the procurement stuff material that would support the NSA. And this is how basically the commercial people went on board, right? And eventually in 2010, the root level got signed by the NSA and in 2011, dot com was signed. 2011, that's only five years ago, even though the RFC dated back from 97. Again, there are none so deaf as those who will not hear. We knew about these things, we knew we had to think to change things, we knew bad stuff were going to happen, and we did not. 
I guess I'm not the only one dealing with procrastination problem after all. There are some positive things coming out of all these three attacks. One, first, the internet war, it launched the firewall industry. Firewall concept were kind of known before, but it's in, uh, starting in 1989 that you start companies with gatekeepers and Mark Runner and uh, Stephen Bellowin and all these other people and the books and so on. This is, this is after that. This is a good thing, after all. The internet worm is a good thing, after all. Oh, and by the way, yeah, Robert Morris, who supposedly would be you know, damned forever, is now a professor at MIT. The DDoS attack, it launches the intrusion detection uh, industry. Uh, just for the anecdote, I was working at IBM Research at that time, and uh, my team in Zurich, we have decided to work already for two years, starting in 98, on intrusion detection, but not yet another sensors, because they already had a couple of sensors at the time, but correlation console. So you have all these sensors, you get this alarm, and you do correlation. And we thought this is, this is a good thing. It wasn't, didn't exist at that time. Now you, you can buy, this is called a SIM, right? So security, information, and event management, it's a big business. But at that time, it didn't exist. And for two years, I had been knocking on the door of Tivoli that IBM had just bought at that time because Tivoli had, you know, business was network management, console production, uh, uh, performance management, and so on. They had these consoles, beautiful consoles, they had this inference engine, they had these uh, standard uh, protocols, they had agents on all machine possible, imaginable at that time. So I thought, hey, that's, that's, that's a sweet deal for you. I'm, I'm bringing you a new thing you can do in your console, which is correlating alerts. And for two years, they have totally ignored us. They said, ah, security now. Right. No, it's not for us. Not for us. February 2000, DDoS attack. Two weeks after that, Tivoli announced worldwide availability of their first intrusion detection correlation console by the end of June. And I read the press release, like everybody else, when arriving at the office, and I said, holy, I, I screwed up. I mean, I didn't do my job properly. My job would have been to find out that there was somebody doing this somewhere in Tivoli, right? The same day in the afternoon, I get a phone call by somebody in Austin who said, hi, I'm the new product manager for the new Tivoli risk manager product. I'm told you have a software for me. So, we worked and then very well, eventually we made the product on time, first to market, correlation console, and so on, and then many others came afterwards. The irony is that you really don't need a correlation console to detect a DDoS attack, because when you have a DDoS attack, you detect it. I mean, it's, it just doesn't work, but it's okay. It, it was the missing argument in the business conversation. So it was a good thing. Oh, and, and, and the guy, Mafia Boy, he is now a white hat selling his consulting advice to a company in Canada. DNS poisoning, uh, uh, the two days I'm always putting there is when we first started knowing about the problem and when the real problem happened. DNS poisoning, um, this is really what kicked out DNSSEC, as I have shown in the previous slides. This is really how it started. And, and then, was named in 2010 one of the 21, there are not many, 21 trusted community representative for the DNSSEC group. It's something. So, the question I have is, why didn't that happen before? Why, why did we have to wait for a major attack in order to figure out that something was, was wrong, right? I, I, I'm not sure, to be honest. I'm not, I'm not completely sure. And, okay, that's all. So, I'm not going to say more. You think by yourself. But it's amusing, right? If you think all these major things, all these bad guys, eventually none of these attacks did really cost that much. 
In fact, when you think of the benefits that they have brought back, they are among the best things that have ever happened to the internet security point of view, to some extent. Now, not that all of these guys are at the same level. Right? Some of them did really stupid things without thinking, and some others maybe not. So, what are the solutions? I mean, this was 20 years ago, it was like 15 years ago, so that, yeah, I think that's changed, right? So now we have solutions to these problems, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's true, we have lots of research, lots of research. As I've said, you know, IEEE has been created, has been created in 1980. There was actually this website where you can go, it's very well done, they have this, uh, the top 50 words in all the publications of each year, and, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's changing automatically, and it's very amusing. You see how the topics have changed over years. So 80 was mostly system-oriented, the 90s we start looking about distributed system, networking, protocol, messages, a bit of crypto, and then 2000, much more attack-oriented, because now Security for obscurity is gone, so it's okay to talk about attacks. So we start talking about attack disclosing, you know, things we could do, and 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 more and more and more and more like that. Because now, I would say it's a bit too much that it's a pendulum, right? First we never talked about it, now we just keep talking about it. Again, this oh, yet another attack against this, yet another attack against that. There are so many attacks you can run. I mean. There are very low hanging fruits here, but it's really cool. The media love it. You know, the media love to hear about yet another juicy attack against your latest gadget and whatever. Other conferences have started uh, appearing also because there were more money and more researchers, so they needed more places to actually have publications. Right? This is what we do as a living. So, AXAC 1985, Israel in Europe 90, but it was only every two years at the beginning. USNIC Security in the 90s, CCS 93, CMAD 93, uh, 96, but then followed by RAID since then in 97, so an intrusion detection thing, MDSS uh, 97. So, big push in the 90s, as you can see. And, and for you know, record, ACMCCS initially got created because there was a feeling that uh, IEEE SMP at that time was too much uh, focusing on a subset of problems that were not the very, very important ones. It was too, too US centric and so on, and they just they, they wanted to make it much more international. This is why I think the third edition was in India, I think, after two ones in the US. Uh, initially created, pushed by Ravi Sandhu at the beginning. And, uh, and as a reaction of that, then IEEE SMP then opened its PC membership, and, and this is how you also have see the the topics in covered by IEEE SMP to dramatically change uh, after 95, 96, and, and, and since then. And, um, and now, you know, we have all these conferences, and we have an incredible amount of people working on all kinds of stuff in research. We have a booming business as well. We have these new conferences where we keep talking about new attacks. We have the two most uh, visible one are probably DEF CON, which was created in 93, initially with 100 people. It was supposed to be a one-time event. Last year, they had 22,000 participants. 22,000 participants. Black Hat was created in 97. Now it's a very good, well-run business. It has every year a conference in the US, in Asia, in Europe, attended by thousands of people as well. I'm not even talking about the RSA kinds of things and others, right? There are, it, it's, it's, it's incredible. Everybody's talking about security, security, security. Forbes in January said there was a 1 million cybersecurity job openings in 2016. Information Weeks they said there were 1 to 2 million jobs in the field by 2019. So it's it's really there, right? Now nobody can say, oh, we didn't know. It's there, there's a lot of money, lots of opportunities, lots of capital, in, uh, venture capital investment in startups and so on and so forth. So it's, it's big. And we have the NSSEC, 
it's finally deployed, and we have IPv6 coming that comes natively with IPsec. It's there, it's developed. So things are good, right? It's, it's, it's okay, we're fine, eventually. Kind of. Um, I'm not sure we really have learned from the past, unfortunately. I, I'm really afraid that whatever we are seeing in all these events and, and, and products and, and new announcements and everything is another kind of dahu. I'm really sorry to say so. But, you know, with, uh, in 2009 we had this uh, attack against Google called Eurora and many other companies, also called the Hedrack. People said, oh, that's, that's big, that's, that's the big problem we have to go after. We have to chase the insiders, because the insiders, this is a new big problem. Well, guess what? Intrusion detection, the field, started more than 20 years ago based on the desire to detect the masqueraders, which is exactly that. So it's nothing new. But suddenly this is the big thing. When Stuxnet came out in 2010 and its you know, successors, APT kind of things, Advanced Persistent Threats, Ghost, Flame, Duke, and others, now APT is a big thing, Advanced Persistent Threat, the very nasty, stealthy malware, very complicated to get, they have specific characteristics that make it very hard to catch them, you need my new product, my new technique, because the other ones forget about it, my new thing, my new thing, my new thing, this is the thing, the new thing, right? This is what's important. And then we had Snowden in 2013, and now data exfiltration is the new big thing. This is, you need to buy my DLP, data leak protection system, in order to catch that. That's, this is all good, right? These are important problems. I'm not, I'm not discounting that, but we haven't fixed the old problems. We haven't. It seems that we are just hiding all the mess we still have there by putting the lights, the spotlight on something new. And we just forget the mess we have there. We still have a lot of mess to fix, but it's no fun. So in 2012, there was a workshop organized by NSA. And, okay, NSA is, is probably not the body you would quote as the visionary for security in the commercial world, but it was a very interesting workshop. Uh, Robert Koshawa and Carl Lender, Lender made the final report, and they basically said that, among the things. There is a need for a strategic initiative to advance security from the current patchwork of phone solutions and ad hoc approaches. Resources should be shifted to focus on the development of a cohesive and organized body of knowledge as a foundation for the field of cyber security. Basically, we need science. We need science for security. We, we don't have science. We have lots of people looking at lots of things here and there and there and move on to something else afterwards. Which is not what we really need. Sorry, I went too far. If you think what science is, it says, scientific method as defined in dictionaries, principles and procedure for the systematic pursuit of knowledge involving the recognition and formulation of a problem, the collection of data, collection of data, through observation and experiment, and the formulation and testing of hypotheses. This is what science is about. It requires experiments. It requires reproducible, reproducible experiments. It requires data, all things that we are lacking in security. Experimental validation is at the core of every scientific discipline, which we are truly lacking in security. Everybody runs his own little experiment with his own little data and then claims, oh, I'm sorry, I can't share with you, it's confidential. Oh, it's confidential, it's private, it's, it's, it's dangerous if I share it with you. Right? So how can I compare apples with apples? I can't. So, the problem we have today is that we still, as I said, we have the old problems. They are still there. But we have brought new solutions. And those new solutions, because they haven't learned from the past, they have brought with them their own bags of new problems. And I just, and I could go forever with lots and lots of examples. I just want to take one, just one single. Hopefully this will, you know. So we, we are, there is, a, as I said, this massive trend to pay attention to the new hack of today, 
instead of looking for boring old things like default passwords. You remember 1979, the password paper by Robert Morris, father? Well, we still haven't fixed that. And another problem is race condition in software, also called TOC2, so time of check, time of use. The first case was in the 60s, identified in the 60s, in the Turing Award lecture paper from 91. So these are old things. We should, we should have found a solution to that by now, right? Well, we haven't. And this IoT trend, Internet of Things, where you have lots and lots and lots and lots of devices using stupid default passwords and bad code made it even worse. Because now these old problems are hitting us in the face very badly. You just want an example? Here's an example. Oh, oh yeah, and by the way, when you hit them, it's not only information anymore which is leaking, because these things do actually have cyber physical presence. Bad stuff can happen to real people. But let me give you an example. You have this site, showdown.io, it's a website, they track, they scan the web, the, the internet, all the time, every day, and they look for all kinds of stuff, and you can make search, for instance, like this one, like, give me all the machines that are using default passwords. And just as two days ago, there was 40,000 results. Okay. Oh, 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 and let's, let's have some fun. What are those devices? Well, roughly half of them, Telnet automated, so Telnet is, is listening and you can log in with a default password. But look at this one. You can probably read it here. It's, it's called ATG. Automated Tank Gauge. This, this, is, this is really cool. Right? This is when you just fuel in your car. Now these things are connected to the internet and they have this thing, a protocol running on port 1001, port of the end, 10001. And, and you can use this full password and you can say, well, tank is empty. Or any other stupid thing you, you can think of. Right? In 2015, somebody scanned for them and found 5,000 of them that were just, just there, available for grabbing. I, I tried the search two days ago, it was 12,000. It's not getting any better, right? Have we really learned from the past? Let's put it all together. Default passwords, race condition, and we have Mirai. What is Mirai? It's actually a malware which, uh, if you have access to a Linux box, uh, there is, they found out they found out that, uh, well, let's put it this way. Uh, the facts are in October 21, so a few days ago, right, there was this major distributed denial of service attack against DIN DNS infrastructure. And they managed to just flood them so badly that many sites were hit. They were, you were not able to do the resolutions to go to Twitter, Airbnb, and so on, in some places in the world. That was really bad. How did it happen? Oh, sorry, I forgot. How did it happen? It's because supposedly there were lots and lots of, of uh, Internet of Things devices that had been compromised by, you know, mostly default passwords and all kinds of things like that. It's not getting any better at all. Now we have DNSSEC. It's great, right? It's a good thing. But DNSSEC, because now when you make a DNS re request and you have a reply, you get all the certificates with you, the response you get is much bigger than before. And now people are using this to do a new kind of attack, which is called a reflective denial of service. It makes their life much easier. Shouldn't we have thought about that? Shouldn't we have thought of a way to prevent this from happening? Well, clearly we didn't. IPv6 is good, right? It was supposed to be simpler. But actually we made it much more complicated for the security people because now we have all these fancy extensions and we have all these fancy multicast addresses that make scanning easier. And now you have SMPv6, which is mandatory, which creates new kinds of opportunity for DDoS attacks and so on and so forth. Even though it's a good thing. And also people think, oh, with IPv6 we don't need nothing anymore. 
So why do we need a firewall, right? So now we have all these devices, IoT devices, using IPv6 addresses, who are completely naked in front of the whole world. At least before with NATIM, it wasn't that easy to, to contact them. Well, forget UPnP. So, you know, I, I could go forever and ever and ever. Um, I, I won't, because time is over. But the elephant in the room, privacy, big data, right? It's terrible. I think we have lost this one already. We don't, right? Just, I, I, I'm not a big Google Map user, but I have it on my phone, so I use it from time to time, rarely. But I have it. And I've had it for a couple of time, a couple of years. So I recently, someone told me, hey, have you checked your Google Map history? In Google, there is a website, you can Google for it, you know, Google Map history. And I went there and I see years of data for me. I said, oh, oh. And I said, okay, let's say two or three years ago. And then you have a map of the world and all the points where you have been. I said, really? And I said, oh, I was in China last year? Where? I zoom in, and I zoom in, and I zoom in, and I said, Shanghai, and I could go everywhere there I was. I said, come on, I mean, Google is not even reachable in China. No, but. Your phone is getting GPS data, collecting them, and when you're back, transmit them. So it's, it's in the cloud. You can delete those data. You can. You have to figure out that it's there, and you have to delete day by day, which is not very really amusing, but you can. And Google is very transparent about it. How many other applications do you have on your phone which is collecting GPS data? How do you know if you can delete it? How do you know to whom they are sending? For what purpose? Anyway, privacy is, is just so. SDN, you guys love SDN, I guess. Networking, really cool. Virtualization, that's really cool. It's software. <laughs> software, security, software, security, ah, don't really go well together. It's supposed to help. We had a DAXTOOL seminar organized in September uh, with uh, Sven Dietrich and Frank Agel and Adam Koenig with 40 people, full week on SDN security. It was very interesting. We can talk about it afterwards if you want. BGP, I'm just still waiting for the big, big BGP hijack that people will eventually use to wake up. Two years ago with one of my PhD students, we just did some study. We found out every day three BGP hijacks taking place every day, for one day, every day. One day, and then the next day three others, and the next day three others, and the next day three others, and so on. That was continuous activity for more than two years. I don't think this is a coincidence or just an accident that some, somebody's playing, doing bad stuff, and when you start messing with BGP, then boom. Bad stuff can happen. And of course, firmware, and then let's try to figure out how to define a security policy eventually. Let's try to people to explain to people what security is about. And let's measure how efficient we have been in telling them. So I think this is going to be my conclusion. Uh, we are the good guys, and, and we have to bring with us all the bad stuff of the past. And whenever we invent something, instead of helping us to lighten this bag, it makes it even worse. We keep adding, adding, adding problems without solving the old ones. And the good guys, they love the new technology we are creating. Because this is more opportunities for them to move forward. So it's a question mark. Are we losing the race? So. I think to be you know, in sync with what is happening today, I would say it's too early to call. Uh, and I want to be optimistic. So maybe it's not. Maybe we can do something, but I'm not completely, completely confident. Well, thank you very much for your time and your attention. <laughs>